training up for a college of hydraulic tappet knowledge, Jack. <laughs> You're right as rain, Tech. And I should have done it a long time ago. Hap here is one of those old-school mechanics who doesn't think hydraulic tappets ever should have been invented. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. I'm not quite so bad as all that. I'll admit I've sometimes wondered why we have hydraulic tappets, but that's only because it takes me so long to find out what's causing one tappet to clatter. I know what you're up against, Hap. Picking out the duty tappet isn't always easy. It's sometimes like trying to find the one guy who keeps hitting a sour note in a dance band. But Professor Jack here knows his stuff on hydraulic tappets. And as long as the subject's been brought up, let's have him tell us why hydraulic tappets are necessary. I'll do even better than that, my boy. I'll tell you why they're used, how they work, and how to keep them on the ball. Go ahead. I suppose you're going to say they operate more quietly. I sure am, Hap, because it's true. Hydraulic tappets do make the valves operate more quietly than mechanical tappets. But what's even more important, hydraulic tappets make the engine idle more smoothly. And they add miles of life to the engine valve. Very good reasons, Jack, old man. But suppose you explain how that quieter and smoother operation comes about. Okay, Tech. Let's review the design of the cam on the familiar camshaft. You both know that each side of the cam has a ramp called quieting ramp because they're designed to do just that. One ramp gradually lifts the tappet until clearance between it and the valve stem is taken up, so no noise is made at contact. The other gradually lowers the tappet and valve, so there'll be no noise when the valve sits down on its seat. You also know that when a mechanical tappet is used, the lifting ramp on the cam very gradually lifts the tappet and the valve for the first several degrees of camshaft rotation. And you know that the ramp on the other side of the cam lowers the tappet and valve very gradually during the last several degrees of rotation. Without those quieting ramps, the tappet would give the valve stem quite a rap when it started to open the valve. Right. And that valve head, too, would take a beating if the valve spring slammed the valve down on its seat. Now, when hydraulic tappets are used, those quieting ramps on the cams can be greatly reduced. They don't have to be anywhere near as long in degrees of camshaft rotation. Why is that so, Jack? Well, that's because the plunger of the tappet assembly is in constant contact with the valve train. In other words, there is zero lash, which simply means that no clearance has to be taken up because there is no clearance. In other words... The valve is lifted quickly to wide open position, and it's seated just as quickly without any noise. So having no tappet clearance is really why the engine runs more quietly, eh? Correct, Hat. And because hydraulic tappets let the valves open and close quicker is why you'll get an engine to idle more smoothly. Heck's right. You'll understand that better by just thinking about valve timing specifications for a minute. As an example... Let's think about an engine that's got mechanical tappets. Specifications will say the intake valve opens so many degrees before top center. The exhaust valve closes so many degrees after top center. Yeah, I remember that. But I still don't see what it has to do with hydraulic tappets. You will in a minute. The intake valve opens before the piston reaches the top of the exhaust stroke, right? And the exhaust valve doesn't close until after the piston starts down on the intake stroke. All right, then. Those valve timing specifications show that there is a valve overlap, a period of time when both valves are partly open, something that's true of all engines. It's done to get maximum performance above idle speed. Said another way, valve overlap occurs when both valve tappets for one cylinder are on the cam's quieting ramp. One valve is being gradually lifted, the other is being gradually closed. Yeah, and during that valve overlap, the air-fuel mixture in the chamber is going to be affected. The mixture coming in is going to be mixed in with some of the exhaust gases which haven't gotten out yet. When the mixture is not quite right, what happens to engine idle? It's going to be rough. How can it idle smoothly without the proper mixture? Yes, sir, and that can happen easily when mechanical tappets are used. 
Now, it's a different story when hydraulic tappets get into the act. That's because with hydraulic tappets, you can use camshafts with shorter quieting ramps. This means that the valves will have less overlap. In fact, an engine with hydraulic tappets may have a valve overlap of only 30 degrees. A mechanical tappet engine may have a valve overlap of 60 degrees. Cutting overlap that much gives you a far smoother engine idle. Hmm. I'm beginning to see where hydraulic tappets do have an advantage. But I'm still wondering how they add more life to engine valves. No need to wonder, my boy. Just add up the facts. Hydraulic tappets use shorter quieting ramps. That permits the valves to open and close faster. As a result, there's a much clearer path for hot exhaust gases to get out. That blowtorch effect you sometimes get with slower opening ramps is avoided. Right, Tech. The hot exhaust gases don't keep rushing through a small area opening, so there's very little chance of burning the seat and valve face. Now I get it. Hydraulic tappets make faster valve action possible. Sure. Remember that with hydraulic tappets, you don't have to worry about an adjustment factor holding the valves open. The clearance between tappet and valve stem is automatically taken up by the tappet. It's constantly adjusted each time the valve opens and closes. You could even say that the hydraulic tappet is an automatic, self-adjusting link in the valve train. a boy, Jack. That self-adjusting feature sure is a big advantage. As an example, even Hap knows that compared with an inline six, the valves, rocker arms, and push rods in V8 overhead valve engines make a longer valve train. Oh, that I know. But what's it got to do with tappets? Oh, Hap, use your noodle. When any engine gets hot, there's a lot of expansion in the block and valve train. Sure, Hap. There may be as much as 30,000 expansion to adjust for. Mechanical tappets couldn't satisfactorily handle that much change in clearance. On the other hand, hydraulic tappets compensate for that expansion automatically. Ah, oh, now that begins to add up. I didn't realize they could take up that much of a chain. They do a good job of it, too, Hap. And it's easy to understand when you know just how they work. I've taken one tap of the part so we can cover the operation in detail. Here you are. All the parts of the spring-loaded flat check valve tappet. Let's brush up on the part names and see exactly how they work. Now, first, there's the tappet body. Inside it goes a plunger spring. Then the valve retainer. Next, the check valve spring and the flat check valve. Finally, the plunger and the cap. A spring clip holds these parts securely in the body. Golly, not so many parts at that. No, it's really quite a simple unit. And it's easy to follow how it operates. Look at this for a second. You see this slanted hole in the oil feed groove in the tappet body? That's where oil enters the tappet. This groove lines up with a passage from the oil gallery. Now, opposite that hole in the body is an undercut in the plunger. It forms a chamber, or annulus, completely around the plunger. A hole in that undercut part lets oil enter inside the plunger, forming a reservoir. Yeah, Hap, and from that reservoir, oil is admitted to the lower part of the tappet, between the body and plunger, by means of the flat check valve. The chamber in the lower part of the body is called a pressure chamber because when the cam lifts the tappet body, it puts that oil under pressure. The body and plunger, then, are raised as a unit. Speaking of plungers, somebody better turn this record before the needle plunges down the hole. Well, now you know why hydraulic tappets are used, and you know the various parts. Suppose we talk about how oil flows within the tappet. Okay, Jack, go right ahead. Fine. We'll start with the reservoir. That's inside the plunger, remember, and it's filled with oil from the oil gallery. Now, that oil in the reservoir, due to pressure of the incoming oil, forces the check valve off its seat. It then enters the pressure chamber below the plunger to fill any void caused when the plunger's spring pushed the plunger up. As the camshaft turns, the cam lobe comes up against the bottom of the tappet body and pushes it up. The oil trapped in the pressure chamber by the closing of the check valve 
is incompressible. So any force applied to the body is transferred to the push rod directly through the trapped oil and the plunger. The trapped oil, in effect, acts very much like a solid piece of metal. Now, after the nose of the cam has passed under the tappet body, the valve spring closes the valve and forces the push rod down. The plunger and tappet body also return to the at-rest position. Oil in the pressure chamber, Hap, can bleed out in only one way. It is a controlled oil bleed upward between the body and plunger. Follow that? Oh, kind of like a metered oil bleed. Now you're talking. An oil that bleeds from the pressure chamber in that way returns to the reservoir in the plunger. That calibrated bleed, Hap, is the big key to tappet operation. That bleed is mainly how the plunger automatically adjusts itself to compensate for changes in the length of the valve train. I get you. You mean the variations due to expansion of the block, push rod, and valve stem that affect tappet clearance? That's the idea. If a lot of expansion takes place, say, during high-speed driving, valve spring pressure will force the plunger deeper into the tappet body always maintaining zero clearance and yet not holding the valve open. On the other hand, as the engine cools down and the valve train contracts, the plunger spring maintains zero clearance by keeping the plunger against the push rod. In the meantime, oil feeds in from the reservoir to fill the void in the pressure chamber. So the pressure chamber is always filled with the right amount of oil as determined by the plunger position. In short, Hap, that explains the self-adjusting feature. Yeah, Hap, that means there's always contact between all the mating parts of the valve train. That's what the term zero lash means. No clearance in the valve train. That plunger spring keeps the plunger up against the push rod when the valve body is not being raised by the cam. In addition, the check valve spring keeps the check valve closed until reservoir pressure overcomes spring pressure in order to let more oil into the pressure chamber. Good going, Jack. That's a neat explanation of tappet operation. Yeah, man. It sure clears up a lot of funny notions I used to have. Now, how about explaining some occasional cases of tappet noise, the kind more apt to happen than any others? Good suggestion, Tech. I've got some examples in mind. Uh, for instance, you may hear a tappet noise when the engine is started after the car has been standing idle. Actually, a little noise upon starting is normal. We shouldn't try to correct it by replacing a tappet. That condition is due to a normal leak down of oil. This happens when the tappet stops in its raised position and remains under steady pressure from the valve spring trying to close the open valve. That type of noise will go away shortly after the engine starts running and oil is again pumped up inside the tappet. But what if the noise doesn't go away? Well, that's something else again. If the noise remains, there might be excessive clearance between the plunger and body, resulting in too much leak down. In a case like this, you can fill the tappet by quickly pressing the valve spring down. That will cause the pressure chamber to take in an extra supply of oil from the reservoir. And that should make the noise go away. But if the tappet has excessive leakage, the noise will come back. Try filling the tappet three or four times. If the noise comes back each time, replace the tappet. Okay, that clears up that type of starting noise. Good. Now let's consider a running tappet noise. Say you run into a condition where the tappet clatters after high-speed driving. A suspect number one on your list should be air in the oil. You mean foaming? Right. If the oil level in the crankcase is too high... The crankshaft will churn it up like an egg beater whips up some egg whites. Remember that too low an oil level will also cause air bubbles to be trapped in the oil. The oil pump will gulp in air along with the oil. Yeah, Hat, and those air bubbles in the oil will be carried into the tappets. You know why that's bad? Well, uh, why? Uh, maybe you better tell me. Simple, my boy. Air bubbles are compressible. Oil isn't. Oil with air in it acts like a spring instead of a solid piece of metal. In other words, the tappet can't maintain zero clearance 
because the plunger isn't held solidly against the push rod. Oh, I get it now. Ordinarily, the air will bleed out and the tappet will become quiet. But this could take as long as 20 minutes. However, instead of a faulty tappet causing noise, it's the air getting into the system. That's what you've got to correct. Gosh, no wonder the tappet gets blamed for noise. An air leak could be an easy thing to miss. That's just it. Too many mechanics overlook that and replace tappets unnecessarily. Don't you do that, or we'll be replacing you. <laughs> tech has got a right to beef about that, Hap. However, there are times when you may have to replace a tappet. Like one with a stuck plunger, for example. You know, of course, that dirt is the greatest enemy of hydraulic tappets. It can make the plunger stick and bluey. No more hydraulic action. If an owner fails to change oil when he should, it becomes contaminated by the usual carbon and other products of combustion. That's why the oil filter should be changed every 5,000 miles. If it isn't, dirt will get a chance to foul up the tappets. Right. So if you run into a noisy tappet that you know is not caused by air or excessive leak down, then chances are the plunger's stuck. Any quick way to check that? Well, there sure is. If the plunger is stuck, you'll find you can rotate the rocker arm slightly on its shaft when the engine is not running. And when it is running, there'll be a lot of clearance between rocker arm and valve stem. That's because there's no pressure on the push rod when the valve is closed. Yeah, Hat. And in a case like that, play it safe and replace the tappet. I see. And getting it out and cleaning it wouldn't do much good. Well, you run a risk when you remove a tappet for cleaning. You may or may not do a good cleaning job. But the only way you'll really know is when you reinstall the tappet and get the engine running again. And by then, you've used up a lot of time and labor. Now, wouldn't you turn blue if you had to do that work all over again to install a new tappet? You bet I wouldn't. And the customer, wow, he'd turn purple when he got the bill. Yeah, I sure see why it's better to replace a tappet when we know the plunger's stuck. In fact, I feel better about the whole subject of hydraulic tappets. You should, my boy. Jack's done a swell job of clearing up some of the main points on hydraulic tappet service. And to help you remember, here's a reference book. It's got extra information you'll find handy when working on hydraulic tappets. Swell, Tech. I sure can use that book. Fine. We sure can use mechanics who are up to date on service know-how. It's another way to keep our service customers satisfied, which means better things for all of us. <laughs>